Welcome to 32 Bar Cut, the show, a show where we talk with our friends about what it's like to be a performer. Today on 32 Bar Cut, the show, we are sitting down with Chicago actor Travis Turner. It's time to welcome on our guest, my favorite by far, the Chicago star, Travis Turner. I am so thrilled to introduce you to today's guest. Travis Turner is one of the earliest friends I made when I made my transition to musical theater in Chicago. We chit chat probably twice a week on FaceTime. And so I am so happy to introduce you to him so that you can get to know a little more about him too. Welcome to the show, Travis Turner. Oh my God. <laughs> hey, huh? <laughs> How are you? Oh, good to see you. It's good to see you too. How are you doing? How have you been during all this? How are you doing? Oh, uh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> but, uh, you know, up and down. You've been right there with me. Um, yeah. But I'm in a good spot right now. And I think that's sort of the uh, the most important thing. Yeah. Really good. And like, uh, it's like a beautiful day here in Atlanta. So like, things are looking up. Oh, I miss that Atlanta weather, man. Like it's it's snowy here in New York and so cold it like chokes you when you walk out. But you know what that's like because you lived sure you lived in Chicago for how long? Um. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, I went up there for school at the, in twenty uh, two thousand and one, um, and yeah, I left uh, in twenty eighteen. Left in wow. twenty eighteen. Yeah. You like you lived lived in Chicago. I lived in Chicago more than I lived anywhere else in my life, including Atlanta. Because you yeah. left for college for Northwestern, and I assume you were you were eighteen at the time. Yep. So what yep. was that like? Like, because I mean, we we're both from Georgia. Um, for those of you who don't Clayton know, <laughs> that yeah, Travis and I grew up in Clayton County. Never met each other. Never knew each other. Um, and I could, I think I speak for both of us, that proud moment when Clayton County showed up on the, on the board during the election last year. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. coming from a town like Clayton County and then leave, leaving to, to live in Chicago for me was a culture shock. And I mm. was, uh, 23 at the time, 22. So what was that like for you at 18? It wasn't as big of a shock for me as I, as it likely was for you. I, I'd lived in Kansas as a kid for like six years. Shout out to Kansas City. What's up, Austin? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, so I was, I was used to snow. I was used to the weather. I was used to sort of um, at least going to school in Evanston and sort of Northwestern. I was used to kind of not having as many black friends. Um, as I as I did in in Georgia, um, but also my high school was pretty diverse too. Um, anyway, and so yeah, it wasn't like the the weather thing for sure was like something, but I was like all for it, and I really didn't feel kind of the huge difference until actually until I graduated college and oh. sort of became an adult and and didn't have like the structure of school anymore. Mm -hmm. And that for me was really when like the winters actually started to feel like something when like seasonal um, affective disorder, like when that became a thing. Um, I also had a car, so like, I just had different responsibilities than I did as a kid. And it, yeah, that really hit for me, like 2005. Oh, wow. And that makes yeah. me think like, because when you did leave Northwestern, did you, did you all do like a, a showcase? I say this because I didn't do a musical theater program. You know this. Yeah. And so this whole showcase thing was very new to me when I started to meet my musical theater friends. But I'm assuming at a big school like Northwestern, you would do a showcase. And so did you, when you did yours, did you like your presentation? Did you like what you had mm -hmm. to present? Did, yeah. did you book an agent? <laughs> like, what, what was your showcase experience at Northwestern? It was weird. It was weird that there was so much emphasis placed on it, I felt like. Um, mm. And maybe that was like just me or like my sort of the folks who I was around. But yeah, it felt just like all important and all consuming. We had a, we had a Chicago showcase, which sort of 
everyone who was like a, a theater senior could participate in. And then we had a New York showcase. And that was that was a bigger to do. We took a class um, in winter quarter, Northwestern's on the quarter system. So we took a, we auditioned fall quarter, senior year. We uh, took a class senior uh, winter quarter, and then we actually went over spring break or just after spring break. So the first week of spring quarter. Um, and yeah, I, I remember sort of reading a lot of, a lot of different plays, a lot of different scenes. And that's really what we would do is just like bring a scene in, you know, and like there was about 10 of us or maybe a little bit more sort of in the straight play in the drama division. And you just like read scenes for an hour and come back the next day. And we did that, you know, three or five or three days a week that entire quarter. So I loved that part of it. I ended up doing a scene from Our Town. Okay. It's the um, the soda fountain scene. I was George and this really amazing actor named Greta Lee, who's, um, I mean, she's like, she's a star. Um, <laughs> she's on Russian Doll. I think I saw on Deadline not too long ago that she's shooting um, The Morning Show with Jennifer Aniston and Reese oh, Witherspoon wow. right now. Yeah, she's like a legit star. She was on um, on Broadway in Spelling Bee and uh, a couple of other things. I mean, just like killing it. She's she's really wonderful. Um, go to her Instagram. She's amazing. But yeah, so she and I, and I think it was kind of a cool angle because it was like the black guy and the like Asian girl doing this like quintessential American piece. So that was really cool. I ended up getting like a a call in for Lincoln Center for like a reading that I auditioned for. And a bunch of just sort of like headshot requests, but nothing really came of it. I did meet with an agent. Um, and I remember feeling like they didn't believe in me. <laughs> like even just sort of in the quick meeting that we had, you know, she was like being friendly. But she said, you know, you're an all right actor. And <laughs> I remember feeling like, Whoa. I don't think you really like me. Um, so I never did any kind of real follow up with that. And I knew ultimately that like the plan at the time was to get to New York eventually, but that like I wanted to be in Chicago for just the, like a smidge to do some work. And I already actually had like a, sh a show lined up for the summer. So I was like, it's cool. I'm going to go back to Chicago and do do a little bit there. And then I'll be in New York in a, in a year or two. Uh, here we are, you know, 18 years later or 13, 14 years later. No, 16 years later. Okay. Map on the slide. <laughs> I um I'm actually curious more about the the showcase part too because so when you when you went in you said you did a Chicago showcase and a, a New York showcase was it just strictly Northwestern students or did you all was there DePaul and Columbia or not really Yeah no I believe that certainly then and I'm pretty sure this is how they do it now sort of each school holds their own showcase and mm. You'll just have a night where you invite agents and casting directors in and they'll come and sort of see whatever your, your pieces are. Um, at the time, it a lot of energy went into the New York showcase and the Chicago showcase was more just sort of like, hey, you know, grab a buddy and rehearse this scene. What scene are you guys doing? Okay, cool. Keep it under two minutes and you'll go on third. Like it was a really sort of loose production um, in the way that like the North, the New York one was just very rigid and very sort of um, structured. They also, I guess it's worth noting that like at the time, and I believe they still do, Northwestern had like two showcases in one night. They had a music theater showcase and a, like a drama showcase. Um, and I was one of three people that year who were chosen to do both, which was pretty cool. Very so, cool. you know, we had to do like, you know, two little short songs and uh, and then like change our and we had like agraphy and everything for like the musical theater showcase and then you know change your clothes and then you do the the straight theater one um, so that was like a I mean it was incredibly stressful um, and perhaps not like super fruitful but like a, a huge honor nonetheless so yeah yeah I um I I wanted to ask too because um I didn't come from a theater program. But 
as I've met you and our, our other friends and our other peers in this profession, um, I can see where I'm lacking like all the time. Like e- even if it has to do with uh, knowledge of theater shows, you know? Um, and I, I, I'm curious if you felt like when you left Northwestern or even when you left North Atlanta, because North Atlanta is a performing art school in, in Atlanta, did you feel like they definitely got you ready for the next step? Do you think each time you went into these programs that you felt ready to go to the next step and that you felt like like you were educated and equipped and, and you were like, yeah, I'm on track? Yeah, no, I... Uh... I certainly did coming from North Atlanta, going to Northwestern. Um, and I, I mean, I, I felt reasonably equipped leaving Northwestern mm-hmm. and going out into, into the real world. There are a lot of things that I would change about that program, which has evolved a lot since I was last there. Um, but it, I mean, I think it's kind of tough too. And that like, it's like, it's an undergrad program. And mm-hmm. one at a sort of huge university. Um, and one of the things that I was just really, really interested in at the time was like to not go to a conservatory that may have sort of given me a little bit more technique and other kind of tools to sort of propel me into the world of being a professional actor. But like, I wanted to spend time in the classroom studying other stuff and mm-hmm. kind of, you know, really kind of being curious about other things. Um, so I, I, I don't know. That's kind of a tough one. I felt prepared, but there are certainly things that I would change. And I don't think that like, I get that you're saying too, about like knowing kind of theater history and theater knowledge, but like, you know, everything you need to know. I mean, you're working, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Yeah. I don't know. It is. I, I don't know. I get what you're saying. I, I totally get what you're saying, but I feel like, um, I, it took me a while to get comfortable saying, I don't know that, you know, Mm, like it took me a while to, to not pretend and fake. Like I knew what my colleagues were talking about. And finally, I'm just like, y'all, I don't know. You know, tell me, tell me, you know, or I'll Google it or whatever. But it took a while to feel comfortable and confident to say that because of the whole, you know, imposter syndrome or just, that's real, you know, kind of coasting on my voice, you know. And, and yeah. realizing, oh, as I learn, I need to try to kind of deposit some of that knowledge so that I can take it with me along the way instead of just discarding it when I don't need it anymore, if that makes sense. Yeah. But yeah. I really want to go back to this agent because uh, it's something I've thought about, the agent and client relationship, where you need to you need to like each other, at least enough to to work well together. And yeah. your agent should okay. believe in you, <laughs> you know, yeah. they should believe in you and they should be excited about you. And so what was your journey like getting your first agent and making sure that that match worked, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> funny. It's, it's true. It's so weird that like, I really feel like at that time at, you know, 22 years old that I, I knew that like, this isn't, this isn't it like that in that conversation with that woman after I just like done two monologues and sort of sat down in the office and she's got an assistant over there and cats are running around, (gasps) you know? Yeah. (laughs) Um, But there was just something about like her tone and and what she said. It just felt like, you know what, this isn't it. This isn't, this isn't me. I, I don't know if that was like the right move or not, but like, I I'm glad that I did that. Um, And it, it just felt, it just didn't feel right. Didn't feel like she believed in me. Um, I certainly, but I also want to talk a little bit about like the things that I would, or that I wish that I had done differently as an undergrad and like okay. the program itself and things like that. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. So my first agent actually came from that, um, that Chicago showcase. Um your current agent, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> saw me that night. Um, didn't reach out. Um, I was working in shows. And uh, I believe later that year, this is 05. So the Chicago company 
of Spelling Bee, 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, was holding auditions that fall. Um, I was working at the Marriott in Footloose, and I remember getting a call from a woman being like, hey, you don't know me. I saw your Chicago showcase. This came across the uh came across my computer and i think you would be great for it so like can i submit you and also can we like talk i would be interested in representing you it's like yes and yes like sure okay um and we i ended up you know going to the auditioning and to the audition and like that that whole process was like a, a you know I think there have been like a couple of near misses in my musical theater career that I know you've been there for like some of them. And like, that was one where I felt like this is it. Like, this is, this is the thing. Um, and it was down to like me. And as I understand it, me and two other guys, I met, you know, William Finn and James Lapine and like, you know, wow. four callbacks later and um, didn't book it. <laughs> uh, but I had the agent. And so, yeah, it was, it was cool in that, like, one, like, she remembered me from Showcase, and that, like, all those months later, she was like, I think that that kid who I, who I saw in the question, I think, like, this will be good. And, like, it, it worked. Like, we, we kept getting sort of a lot of validation from that. Um, that being said, I remember sort of, she wanted to go kind of exclusive, Mm -hmm. And this was like at a time where Chicago wasn't all exclusive. Like you could be sort of listed with multiple agents. And I had a second agent who I got a few months after that um, through my roommate, actually, at the time. My roommate was with her as well. And I went in as a reader for my roommate. Oh, wow. <laughs> I went in as a reader for my roommate. And she was like, hey, um, would you be interested in, you know, maybe working with us? Like, that was a good read. And I was like, yeah, of course I would. You know, <laughs> I've got this other thing. And she's like, no, it's no problem. You know, you, you can multi-list. It's Chicago. We're good with that. So, yeah, I had two agents at the time. And then when uh, your agent wanted to go exclusive, I was like, I don't feel comfortable with that. So I think I'm going to go back to this other lady and try to sort of find other representation. I worked with her for a number of years, uh, but then she was kind of at the end of her career and she sort of shut down Chicago offices and moved to LA, but continued to represent sort of remotely, ended up just like not working out. And I was sort of without an agent for like four or five years. I didn't but know it was didn't that really... long. Yeah. But yeah. you had so many but... connections at that point. You didn't need an agent, not in Chicago. Or did yeah, you? I, I mean, mean that, I don't want to speak that's what you. I thought. No, I think that's right. I That's how I felt which was like, I'm not interested in on-camera work anyway. It wasn't popping off the way that it is now. Mm. And I was like, I'm a theater actor. And specifically, like a musical theater actor. Like, that's where my bread and butter was. And I know the casting directors in town right now. So mm -hmm. like, no, I'm good. That, that all seems like such a waste of time. And um, I think it was like 2014 when someone who I'd uh, done a show with, Grace, ended up booking Empire. Mm -hmm. And I knew like a couple of other people who went in for that. And like, yeah, my agent got me this audition for this show. It became like this big, huge thing. And I was like, I think I need to get an agent now <laughs> to sort of see. <laughs> I feel like I'm missing out on some things. Because uh, that's happening? Y'all are, okay, yeah. So and that's when I sort of went back on the hunt. That is definitely the time where I felt like, uh, the, the TV film scene in Chicago blew up with, you know, Chicago PD, Chicago Fire, Chicago Med, um, Betrayal for a second, um, yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. Empire, and now uh, Shameless and The Shy, and you name it. I don't, yeah. I don't, even, I can't even name all the shows co coming out of uh, Chicago right there now. There was like I the Chicago Code, there was The Mob Doctor, there's that show Next. Um, what Southside, the uh, like comedy on, um, I forgot what channel that's on. Maybe Comedy Central, actually. Yeah. Easy, easy on Netflix. Is it called Easy? Really? Yeah. That's Chicago? I didn't Definitely know that. Chicago. They don't say, like, you can just, when you watch the show, you know it's Chicago. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the train or they make Chicago references. It's like shot in Chicago. But yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a reason now to have an agent in Chicago. But I can agree with you. When I oh, yeah. was first starting out, 
our, I made theater connections just by crashing equity auditions. And then I was like, oh yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm with Court Theater and Marriott and Paramount and, you know, and when I did book my agent or when I was signed, the only thing they really sent me on straight away was a lot of commercials. And that world mm -hmm. was very different from theater. Like you could, you might get the copy right when you walk in the room or they have you do, you do, you know, doing strange things. Or there's no things. copy whatsoever. Or there's yeah. no copy whatsoever. They're like, just, just look around the corner. Oh, oh, uh, what corner? You know, just create it, but look around the corner. You know, like, I don't know what's happening. Okay. Sure. But yeah, I mean, but there's so much money in commercials too. And, and Chicago has a huge market for, for advertising and everything. So yep. I, I loved it. I was like, this is great. It gives me something to work towards and maybe I can pay my bills, but. Exactly. Yeah. Cause it's a great way to supplement your income mm -hmm. to, I mean, it's, it's cool to sort of build up that resume. Like if you can, of like, oh yeah, I, like my commercial game is like, it's on point. Um, cause that could potentially lead to other on-camera opportunities. Absolutely. And yeah. It's just also just like diversity of work. Like you get to sort of switch it up and do something different. Why yeah. Not? Yeah. Why not? Why not? Um, let me see. Let me check my notes. Cause there's other things I want to ask you. Oh yes, 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 yes. Speaking of switching it up. So you surprised us all because you never tell us what shows you're in. We all just like find out or you're like mention it casually while we're sitting down to dinner or something. But I remember a few years back when you did your first show with Second City, it was like American something. What was it called? Uh, that one was a, a American mixtape. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. American mixtape. And you you didn't want us to come see you, but we all came together. It was like me and BA. Maybe Brenda came along. Austin, did you come with us? We can't remember. We can't remember. That doesn't matter. Let me get to my point. My point is, so here you are straight theater actor, musical theater actor, now at a comedy-based uh, performance art form called The Second City. Like, did you did you do any any improv beforehand? How did you book this? I, the, the, it's a oh. mystery to me. <laughs> no, <absolutely laughs> No, not that you're not deserving. That came out so wrong. But I mean, oh, I no, mean no, no, no. you do, you are always working. You are always, uh, uh, you know, busy doing something, doing something. So all of a sudden you're like working at Second City and it was a shock. So tell us about it. It was a shock to me too, believe me. <laughs> I think like that was my like Chicago experience. And I think that's one of the really cool things about a place like Chicago that like that's sort of possible because there's so many strong institutions. And I don't know, like I, it sort of came along at a, at a nice point where like people were sort of looking for folks to do a variety of different things. Um, like I, I, I wonder if people in other markets are really sort of able to do that. Mm. Specifically, I guess like people who aren't like, you know, like stars, like just like regular actors who are able to kind of do that thing. Um, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, no, it's so funny that um, that was my first like Second City show like in Chicago. But at that point, I'd already done like three of them elsewhere. My very first one was in 2011. It came right after Porgy and Bess. Oh, wow. Actually. Yeah, yeah. We were um, like that summer after we closed Porgy and Bess. I remember working at uh, I was at Trader Joe's and I got a call like um, or it was an email, you know, from uh, someone at Second City. I think it was Deanna Griffith Irons, who's like sort of the head of diversity there, who's like, we're looking for understudies for like this show that's currently on the main stage. Um, your name came up. I like think you'd be a, a good fit for it. Would you be willing to come in and audition? Um, and I'd heard of Second City because I'd seen one show there way back when I did like a summer camp at Northwestern, summer session in 2000. <laughs> so it had been 11 years. Um, but I was like, um, I like this is, I have no interest in this whatsoever, completely like ready to blow it off. But I said, you know, uh, one of my friends, Nora at Trader Joe's was like, you know, why not? Like truly, what have you got to lose? So just like have the conversations with them, like figure out what they want you to do, you know, maybe go see the show. And so, you know, I checked back in and I was like, you know, what are the things that would be required? Um, just like, tell me more. And I remember she was like, you know, come, come see the show. 
um, because you would be sort of understudying this like main stage show that's currently running. Um, it's called um, The South Side of Heaven, South Side of Heaven. And uh, um, you would sort of prepare a couple of scenes from the show, we, you know, have you with the reader. You might sing a little bit, um, which is why I think sort of you'd be right for this. And, you know, uh, you may have to do a Barack Obama impersonation. I was like, okay, well. Oh, God. No, that's that's not happening. There's no <laughs> way I could do that. Like, <laughs> I have no, I don't have that ability. But um, I saw the show. They let me, they let me see it for free. Nice. I remember exactly where I sat because it was like right by the host stand. They have like sort of just a pair of like um, of seats where they're just like, you know, we usually sort of put like, that's where our people sort of sit. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so cool. <laughs> and um, saw that show, which I think was just like the most, one of the most amazing pieces of theater I've ever seen. Wow. Um, you know, it's it's got these amazing performers, Sam Richardson, who's from Veep. Um, he plays Richard Split on Veep. Um, Edgar Blackman, um, Holly Laurent, Katie Rich, who writes for um, SNL or wrote for SNL, uh, Tim Mason, who's a friend of mine now and somebody who I worked with. So it just like had this like amazingly brilliant cast. Uh, Tim Robinson, who uh, also wrote for SNL. Um, and it was directed by Billy Bungra. I'm sorry, I'm just like shouting out these people just because like, <laughs> one, they're like heroes of mine. But two, like some of them I've actually been able to work with subsequently, like Billy Bungaroth, who directed it, and Julie, who music directed, like became like my friends and people that I collaborated with. And we did the like band together. Like that was them. And I met them like at this audition working on the show. Anyway, I'm sorry. Long story long. I um <laughs> I auditioned for the show. Um I read with Holly. I did a I did a Barack Obama impersonation. It was terrible. Um <laughs> They had us do a scene called Mother to Son, just like a short scene where this like mother's kind of, you know, telling her son what's what. It was played by two men. And so they had me play like the, the young boy. And then they're like, cool, cool. That's great. You know, the sort of mother's lines. I was like, um, ish. And I'm like, okay, could you now read the mother? Like, <laughs> Be ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so I like did the scene as the mother and, um, and then Julie was there and they were like, could you learn this like short phrase for, you know, and like sing it back to us and did that. And I'm like, okay, great. And I ended up like booking it and I'm like, cool. This isn't quite like an understudy thing. We know we mentioned that, but we want you to take this show to Woolly Mammoth in Washington, DC over the holidays. And it'll be their holiday show. Wow. And so like, that was it like 2011 into 2012. Like I did, I did that. And I loved it. There was just something about like, and that was, it was a full sketch show. Like everything was written. There was very, very little improv, but you know, there's room for some improvisation and there was audience interaction. So like, you know, that became very kind of improv -y, but not like a straight like improv set, which I'm terrified of. <laughs> um, and that just went well. And like, they sort of, they, they got me in. And I remember, you know, I had a meeting with the folks, with the producers after that, um, when we got back to Chicago and they were like, we're interested in sort of like bringing you into the fold a little bit more. Do you have any interest in that? And I said, no, <laughs> like comedy really isn't my thing. But like if shows become available and you have like regional opportunities, then like, sure, like totally think of me. And I'm just like super thankful because like they, like every year they would sort of call and be like, hey, we've got this thing, you know, like. Later in 2012, I, I went to Cincinnati with them and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, progressively began to do like more and more improv. But, you know, that was still like a, a fully written sketch show. Um, 2013, we went to La Jolla. And then in 2014 is when I did my first like Chicago show. So, yeah, Second City was a, a major, like a huge, a huge impact on like my professional, like personal life because I met a lot of friends there. And just like, I feel like a lot of growth artistically too. I can't, I can't speak highly enough of, that's interesting. I can't speak highly enough of it, though that was not everybody's experience. Yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, before we, if, if we even get to that, I, sure. I, I want to go back to what you were talking about, uh, the casting director reaching out to you or the artistic diversity director. I, I'm getting her yeah. title completely wrong, but yeah. just you, you saying, oh no, 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 this isn't my thing. And that sometimes we do that. We cast ourselves. Like we don't, 
we don't allow yeah. the casting directors to do the job. We decide, we look at it, we say, no, you got the wrong person. I'm, I'm not the right person yeah. for this. And I'm not even going to go in. I remember yep. when I was sitting down to in an acting class with Heidi Marshall, who used to be a casting director for years. And she was talking about how there are so many actors that just say no. They don't even come in the room, you know, and that's yeah. the first knife in the foot, you know, and yeah. it's interesting to hear you retell this story and actually live it, like watching you live it through your eyes and everything, <laughs> because if if your friend at Trader Joe's hadn't said, Travis, just go in, you know, that maybe that whole chapter of your life would have happened later, maybe not happened at all, but it sounds like it really enriched you. And I think that's the lesson there is that, you know, let them say no <laughs> and not let you. Let them say no. Yeah. Let them say no. If it's something that you think you would like to do. If it's something where you're like, that, like that's, I have no interest in that whatsoever. I think like being able to sort of say no and to own it and like actually know it is, is really important. Yeah. Like no is a complete sentence and it's great mm -hmm. um, as a performer. That being said, like I, I did have an interest in it it ended up being this really, really enriching experience um, that like, you know, sort of gave me a lot over the last like decade. Yeah. And I do remember, you know, Nora in the back, she, just that, she was like, um, if you go in there and make a fool of yourself and you're like, you have a terrible Barack Obama impersonation <laughs> and they have no interest in you whatsoever, like, what did you lose? What did you lose? What, what did you lose? You don't know those people at all. Yeah. You will never see them again if they're not interested. So, like, what's the harm? It's like, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. I mean, I, you know this story, but I have made a fool of myself in front of a director. And um, at least I have a good story about it. Like, at least I can laugh yeah. about it. Um, for those listening and watching, yeah. you're probably like, what is she talking about? I, I had a, a really cool audition for Spike Lee. And I misunderstood completely what was being required of me. And um, I'll tell you all about it another time. We don't have to get into it here. <laughs> but um, also speaking to that audition you had with Second City. My Spellman sister. I mean, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Sister. No, he was like, Spellhouse gave me a hug oh. and everything. But by the end of it, it was just a pity hug, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but speaking to being in that audition for Second City and uh, <laughs> them asking you to, you know, learn this little bit of a song and switch characters and all that. Austin and I were just talking the other day because he said on, you know, the other side of casting tables all the time. Yeah. Like that sometimes, you know, yeah, they want to see if the actor can do more. But Austin, what were you saying about sometimes they you just want to see if people are willing to work hard or. Well, yeah, I mean, some, sometimes like Hamilton's a great example. They give them these huge packets of material. And part of it is because once they get hired into the show, they do have to go into the show in a couple of weeks and know a insane amount of tracks. And that's part of the test. And I think some people are like, why would you give me all this? And I think that, the, the, the well, that's a whole conversation, but it's when you give it. Are you giving it to the first audition? Because that's too much. But if you're giving it to them, you know, for the callback, that's, I think, part of the test. And that needs to be recognized. Right. Yeah, that's, that's real. That's I've, a good point. I don't know. And it's also a part of the casting process too. Like I've gone in for um, auditions for readings or workshops and they don't have time to cast it over a long term, like a long set of weeks or whatever. Yeah. They might only have two yeah. calls or they might have one call. So they give you all of the material they're even considering you for. And they're like, do what you can, you know? And sometimes yeah. you get a week to learn it. Sometimes you get three days to learn it. It's just about how yep. bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? Because it's not really, oh, how much time do you have to, to take this on? It's like, how badly do you want it? Will you stay up overnight to learn this and consume this information? Yeah, I, I guess I'm like of two minds about it. I think like on the one hand, I totally, like, yeah, that's true. But I know that I've been in many times, like I've been in a position where it's like, I can't get somebody to play this for me. And I have to learn all of this material by tomorrow. And I just feel like, like such a jerk, like, I don't know what to do. You know, it's like sort of resources, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm under resourced right now and I would do the work I'm interested, but like, I don't, I have nowhere to go. Um, if it's something where like, I just have to memorize, yeah. I'm, I'm all about like, yeah, let me do the work. But like learning music 
for me at least is like that's a whole other thing and mm-hmm. that's that's a bigger ask i think um but there's nothing like that feeling of like when you've got that whole packet down and you're like okay where do you want to start what do you want? shall we do yeah which one because I've, I've got them all do you uh-huh. want to go in order or you just want the meaty scene like what do you want Right, right. You you tell me. Yeah, there's nothing like that, you know? And we were like, this is me. Yeah. This is all me. And I'm ready. It's all up here. Like, let's go. Let's play. There's nothing like that. There's also nothing like having that whole packet prepared and then being like, yeah, we're only going to hear the first side today. Well, that always happens. I have never learned a whole pack. I probably just once. Yeah. Have I learned a whole packet and they've listened to the whole thing? Just Mm -hmm. probably once Mm -hmm. or twice out of dozens of auditions. And yeah, it's frustrating. But now, I mean, you know, it's going to, you know, it's possible. You know, it's possible. Right. right. Um, For sometimes it's just the casting director sends all that material just in case to cover their steps. Right. Right. And then the director walks in, he's, or he or she is like, no, no, I only want to see the last scene. Yeah. Right. And so. If you have a decent casting director that's thinking about you, they'll tell you outside the room before you walk in so that you're not looking like, you know, crazy. Like <laughs> standing there waiting, like, yeah. mm-hmm, okay, can we? I'm like, no, 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 we're good. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need to see more. <laughs> yeah. Or even like just to know that they may stop you because I've worked with um, yep. a director when I was a reader um, who would stop people mid scene because he had seen enough. And it wasn't because they yeah. were terrible, but. We don't know that. When you're an actor and yeah. you're on the other side, you're like, oh my God, he stopped me. I'm, I must be horrible. Can I leave now, please? You know, yeah. it happens too. I hate that. I get that it happens and I hate that so much. I understand. And I, I'm trying to think of like that happened like in my experience in Chicago. Um, I feel like it must have, but there is this, there has to be this sense of like, this person has done the work. Yeah. And, like, the very least we could do is, like, let them do their work. Even if, like, we aren't super interested. But, like, you, you've you prepared. Yeah. The scene, we have what? Like, two more pages to go? Okay, fine. Just, like, let them, let them work. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. It ain't you. Send the next one in. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just think it's, like, a respect thing in there. I get the time issue. Or, like, I don't want to waste your time either. I know it's not you and we're at the end of page one. But... I don't know. There's like a balance there. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, and, and time management is always a thing with casting, right? Like they, yeah. they always yeah. seem to be a little behind, not always, but sometimes they're behind. And I know that, oh, yeah. you know, if they can make up the time, they will, cause they have, a, you know, 20, 50 other things they could be doing all the time. Yep. Uh, yep. But yeah, I think we do live or in when a- they're ahead. Or and when then they're, they're ahead, I'm sorry, I'm when they're ahead and they're like, "Where are you?" And they're like, I'm, "I'm, I'm here at my time. I'm here at my time. Can I have? Can you give me five minutes? I just walked in. I can I dust the snow off my face? You know." Yep. Yeah. I learned a long time ago that like I, I, I mean, it's one thing to sort of show up like 15 minutes or 10 minutes early. Yeah. But like, I'm not gonna give you. I, I'm. I can't go in that room until like I'm ready. Yeah. And like sometimes that means like I'm just like walking around the block it, because I don't want to get called in early mm-hmm. or like I'm not going to go into the room. I'm going to peek my head in and see sort of where they are and then go walk this hallway or go in a bathroom run or whatever. But like that's the thing, too, of like getting in there and thinking you have so much time and then be like, we're actually ahead. So um, just whenever you're ready, just come on in. And you're like, oh, my God. Yeah, it really oh, it really uh, it messes you up. I mean, it's. Yeah. And and what I do now is when I show up to casting, wherever the building is, you know, if it's Pearl or Ripley or, you know, at Telsey, I do not write my name on the list until I have mm. gone to the bathroom, changed my, changed into my outfit, put my shoes on, dusted my face. Like, you know, am I ready? Yeah. Looked over my size. Okay, now I'm going to put my name on the list because I cannot right. get put in this position where I'm not ready after putting in all this work, learning all these sides, That's learning so this fun. music. And that's another thing, too. I feel like when you get called into these auditions, especially for new works, if I love the music, I can learn it like that. But if I don't, Mm -hmm. 
if I'm not responding to the music, it feels like an uphill climb. And I think the same thing happens to the sides too. Like you were talking about, this is me. I know this. I know this. I feel like when you get those roles that feel very natural and like you can really lean into the language, it just rolls off your tongue. It's nothing to memorize five scenes. I mean, it's not nothing, but it's a little, it, it helps. <laughs> it's easier. Yeah. Yeah. It For helps. sure. I, I mean, I definitely feel that way about the writing where it's like, if I feel like I can actually see myself saying this thing, mm-hmm. I have a phrase like if it like it fits in my mouth, it just yeah. like it fits and I, I get it. It's like, OK, I understand how this thought leads to the next thought leads to the next. And I'm not just memorizing something that doesn't sort of make any like sense to me. Yeah. And like just rote memorization. But it's like, no, that's, there's like a, a thought there and mm-hmm. all of that follows. And it's like, yeah, all right. Yeah, I'm actually and I think that's also sort of a second city thing too because frequently you're like you're just memorizing stuff for you know they do like sort of business things where you're like you know memorizing funny sketches for for companies and then you like got it and you do the thing it's like okay now forget that you know it's like a pump and dump you just like remember I can spit it out to you real quick and then I'm gonna let that go and on to the next one so like that memorization is a bit of a muscle so it does require practice it does. Um, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. It, no, it totally does. And it doesn't mean that you need to practice the same copy. It is something that if you are memorizing something every day, something different every day, it gets easier and easier to memorize things quickly. Yeah. I'm learning yeah. that now for the first time with all these self tapes and things that are coming in because we're we're all sequestered in our homes that oh, I can memorize this in an hour and I can put it on Mm -hmm. tape, which is not Mm -hmm. something I could have done two years ago or maybe even a year ago, but just the, it works. So, Hey, for anyone who's listening or watching, if you have trouble memorizing things, all you got to do is get yourself a little dummy copy every day and work on it every day. And it will get better. It will. And you do the work though. I mean, you, you put in the work to like, to develop that skill, which is incredible. I, I Thanks, you know, Trav. I've always admired that about you. I did serious. Oh my god! Um, <laughs> but uh, what you said too about the, like music, though, you know, like I think if it's if it's well written, it is music. Mm-hmm. If it's well written, you can feel that rhythm. You can feel like the way it's supposed to go, and that will just like make it so much easier. So, yeah, do all the things. All the things. I was thinking too about you. You saying you know that the power of no and like that you know. You can say no. And I I know you and I know you have said no many times. And I I admire that about you because you're a choosy actor. Um, Some would say even a choosy person when it comes to how you spend (laughs) your time. (laughs) Watch it. Watch it. But no, 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 no. To my point is that how did you, is that just a personality or how did you develop that strength and that confidence to say no and to be choosy? Um, I felt like when I was in Chicago, I didn't say no to anything. I was just like, I will do non-union work. You can pay me $200 a week. I will do, you know, I will take a train to Indiana. I just wanted to work. But it, I don't know. Sometimes I got stuck in in in, in uh, productions that didn't really serve me, that wasted my time, didn't fulfill me. Uh, the lesson learned was, hey, maybe I should have said no to that. So how did you learn that about yourself, that you needed that, that it worked for you? Right. Yeah, no, I mean, I had to learn it for sure. Mm. And I think, I mean, I suppose, you know, like, and not saying no works for some people, but just like, and I'm in, in all things, like this has been my experience that for me, um, being able to say no to stuff and learning that I could was just like hugely, I mean, of course it's empowering, but it's like, I think initially I didn't have sort of any designs for my career. Like I just wanted to work. I was just happy to like get in the room. And so it's like, bring me all the opportunities. Yep, yep, yep. I'll do that. I'll do that. What's the pay? Nothing. Sure. I'm on board. What do you, <laughs> just like all all the no's or, or like I'm doing next to nothing in this production or I'm only supporting this other thing. But yeah, sure. Let me have it. Um, and I feel like eventually I began to see one that like I, I was also very reluctant to, to like drop out of anything. Like yeah. I, I'm not a, you know. A person who like drops out of a production once I've sort of accepted that contract because yeah. we hadn't started rehearsals yet. 
Um, and I began to kind of like miss out on like other opportunities. It's like, hey, you want to come work at our theater and do this other thing? Oh, I already committed to being the like fourth banana from the mm-hmm. right in this production at mm-hmm. such and such. Um, and I like that began to sort of affect me. But also, yeah, I just like I wanted to like design my career a little bit more. I wanted to like move into um, different projects and kind of have like a different trajectory. And I feel like that required sort of letting go of some other some other stuff and actually like, you know, saying like, no, I'm not really like a part of that world anymore. No, that job doesn't interest me because I feel like that doesn't really get me like where I want to go. That makes sense. Um, like it sounds like you're saying early on you were willing to take anything for the experience, for the um the resume building, but then as you got gained more experience, you started shaping your career instead of just letting the everything shape you. You were like, "No, no, 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 no. I'm carving this out and I want this and, you know." Yeah. And I think like that's it is like thinking about it more like a career and and I think when you really really like think about sort of all the implications of that word and like that idea yeah that yeah you you sort of begin to like want to, uh, to see a certain progression and I think that sort of more than anything was what it was about was like how do I progress I could keep sort of doing these things or I could try to like be a little bit more intentional as I'm moving mm-hmm. um and that was really helpful it's funny though because later like in my most recent, you know, era of my career, the no took on like a slightly different meaning. It was that, but it was also like, no, because I feel like taking that project would do something to me emotionally. Mm. I've been in a room before where I was in a project that like I didn't believe in or working with people I didn't really want to work with or, you know, was resentful because the pay was crappy or whatever it was, you know the people, the play or the pay, like something wasn't working out Mm. and I've been miserable and I haven't been like the best version of myself. But, you know, like you've experienced me in those moments and like, that's not a great place to be, to feel ungrateful for the work, even though like you have this thing and it's this blessing and it's, it's work, you know, but feeling just terrible about it. So the no also became like, I got to protect myself. And I know that like, I don't want to like, have a project steal my joy. If I'm going to do something, I want to put everything that I have into it, feel fulfilled and also feel like I'm getting something back from that and not like destroying myself. So there's a balance. There's how does this shape my career? Will this damage me as a person? And just deciding, no, seriously, it's so yeah. true. It something can look pretty and shiny, um, and not be good for you. (laughs) There are many things in the world like that. And when it comes to theater jobs, that happens as well. Or even if you feel like- Not every job is for you. Not every job is for you. Or even if you feel like you were being undervalued, you know, and that this this didn't serve you. I remember getting an offer shortly before I left Chicago uh, and they wanted me to uh, understudy for- tracks and um also be in the show and i was like oh i've never i mean i've understudied many times you are you i see your 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 eyes trying trying to figure out what show this was we'll talk about it later um um, because i'm not trying to throw a company under the bus but i i just i didn't i was insulted i was insulted i had worked for this theater um already and i just thought maybe this is the time that they'll bump me up to a principal track. And if, you know, if not, we'll see what happens. And what happened was not something I was willing to take. And even though at that point, it would have been the most I ever made on a contract in Chicago, I said no. And my agent was like, well, I hear you, Adrian. I hear you're coming from. Are you sure you don't want to just do the job just for the health weeks? And I was like, no, you can tell them no, thank you. And I was, I was kind of pissed to be honest, but the 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 older me or the younger me, really, the the me maybe, you know, five years before, two years before, would have said yes for the money, would have said yes just to be in another show, to say I had done this show, and I would have been absolutely miserable. And I would have gotten pegged um uh 
as someone that could swing or someone that could not swing at all, because I didn't right. think I was going to be able to do it. And I had other designs for my career. And yeah. and I, I respect the hell out of swings. There's not something I can do. And I think that's the mm. thing is that I was like, I don't want people to get the impression that I can do something that I really, really, really can't do. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. I mean, that to me is like, that's a, you know, being sort of career minded, but also like thinking like, just in terms of like having a realistic uh, like view of like your skill set yeah. and like where you think like you could actually sort of shine. Yeah. But also too, I think that, yeah, you likely would have become like pretty resentful or, you know, like not been your best self. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, is that, is it worth it? No, I think I have to trust that like something else will come along or if something else doesn't yeah. in like in that time slot that I'll still be okay. Yeah. And I'm, I, I'm making room for other things, but like most importantly, myself. But we're all learning we're going to be okay. We were sitting yeah. down with Stephen Carlyle, who plays Scar, just a, a few weeks ago. And we talk about, you know, how you get that contract renewal at The Lion King every February if you're a, a principal. And so there's always that fear. What will I do if they let me go? You know, will I make it? Well, 2020 showed us all mm. that even if we are unemployed, we will make it and we will be okay. You know, you were about to do, and I wrote the, the name of the show down because um, praise God above, this might be the longest title I've ever read in my life of a, of a, <laughs> of a show. But uh, you were about to work at the Steppenwolf. You were starting rehearsals, in rehearsals already, tech week, some part of it. Second week of rehearsals. Second week of rehearsals for the most spectacularly lamentable trial of Ms. Martha Washington. And... I mean, you were, you had housing up there and you were, you had to, you had to, you had to pivot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's the thing, you know, it's so funny. Sort of one of the things that, that this year has taught me, you know, it's like how vulnerable we all are. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, Friday the 13th, um, Anna Shapiro, the artistic director of Steppenwolf, who was in tech on Broadway for the minutes, like flew back in to be like, guys, um, we're shutting it down. And that was, what, two days, I think, after Broadway, you know, yeah. um, shut down. And I remember, I think you texted me or called me. and like, I called you the in news. the park, I remember. Yeah. And for those, like, two days, I was like, this isn't, this isn't going to happen. Like, y'all, we're putting this time to this rehearsal, and there's no way. Broadway's already shut down. And everyone was like, don't bring that into the room. Like, don't do it. <laughs> it's like... It's not me, y'all. It's not me. I'm sorry. It's the virus. It's the virus. Um, but yeah, that was hard. I, I like, um, because there was an overlap of the show that I was doing in Atlanta at the time, um, mm. Seize the King, and and Steppenwolf by one week, um, and by the grace of God and like awesome producers and casting directors, I was able to like split that week up. I, I guess I can share this. I'm like, wait a minute, should I be saying this? <laughs> but yeah. They... <laughs> Is this like some equity rule? I don't know. Can you? <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> it's done. They, they, it's done. Who's going to check me? You know, Who's going to check me, boo? Um, <laughs> I, I may not be doing this for long anyway. So, you know, like, it's fine. Um, but yeah, so they, they let me like split that week. And so I went to like the first day of rehearsal at Steppenwolf and did the, you know, the next two days, I flew back Thursday morning, like early morning, and we had a student matinee, we had Friday student matinee, Friday evening, we had Saturday two shows, and we closed on Sunday, and then Monday I went right back to Chicago, and on Friday was when, was when we were over, um, and came right back, and that was, yeah, it was just hard, you know, it was my second show at Steppenwolf, a lot of folks in the cast, it was their, you know, Steppenwolf debut, mm. And like that means something. Oh, yeah. Steppenwolf is a is one of those theaters that you like professionally. It it means something in terms of its reputation. I think artistically, it's so just like it can be so filling and like rich and just like oh now we're about to grow. Now we're about to do something. <laughs> um, and I also just really loved the show and the people. Um, so yeah, that was hard. It's still it's still hard. Yeah. Um, I've heard, you know, or at the time, you know, Anna was like, 
we're gonna do the show you know i think it was like 21 22 you know the sets are built like it's gonna happen but that was a year ago you know like who know they didn't know that they were gonna have to push back their entire you know season so yeah. like who's to say but um it's a really really cool show um that that i hope if i'm not in it i get to see it one day i hope so too i hope so too it um uh that also leads me to something I really want to chat with you about in the curtain call. Are you sticking around for the curtain call? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay. So uh, in the, th- in the curtain call, I really want to talk about what you are up to now, what you're considering. Cause I know about it, but I want our viewers and listeners to hear about that too. Um, but we are entering the stage door round. Are you ready to answer some questions? I am. Yes. Okay. Question number one. Who inspired you early on in your career and who inspires you now? Oh my heavens, wow. Uh, who inspires me now? Um a lot of people, you among them. Um <laughs> also my friend Tosin, um, who I think is doing just like some really cool work. Um, and it's really cool. It's really cool seeing both of y'all in like sort of the same industry, but like different, you know, mediums. Um put in the work for those years and like now it's sort of paying off in really exciting ways. It's really, really cool. Yeah. Yay. Oh, well, Travis, stop. Um, okay. (laughs) (laughs) What director would you kill to work with? I wouldn't kill anybody, but we'll, you know, figuratively. Yeah. Yeah, Figuratively. I'm going to kill some insects. I've done that. (laughs) Um, Kill the vibe. I've done that. Um, (laughs) What direct? I mean, I've worked with him before, but I don't care. I want to do it again. Um, Robert O'Hara, yeah, um, who I worked with in Denver, um, Noel Macbeth, and in Chicago, and in, in Booty Candy, it, who directed Slave Play. Um, he's he's just like everything to me. He's so smart. He is, he like demands the best. He's trusting. Like once he sort of knows you, he's trusting and like lets mm. you let you go. Um, he just like gets it. And I think he's like sort of, you know, yeah, he's just, I, I, I can't praise him enough, which is saying something because like my first experience with him was like really sort of difficult, um, which was booty candy. He was, you know, very demanding and, um, had a, a very clear idea of like what he wanted the, the show to be. I felt like, mm-hmm. but he like hadn't worked with me yet. And I feel like he didn't quite trust me. And so that was a day where you felt like going in, like we're going to be tested every day and you've got to show up ready to play. So it's going to be Robert O'Hara for me. I love that. I love that. I hope that you do get to work with him again. Um, and that I get to see something that you do with him. Like I got a chance to see yeah. Slave play and I was like mind blown. Like I needed a sec I needed a second. I needed a whole Q and A. I needed um a support group. Like I needed to yeah. talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot. You gotta process that. Yeah, I actually like, I did. Down I s- from this. Um, Paris and I went out to to eat afterwards because he didn't see mm. it with me, but he had seen it two times before. He saw it off Broadway and then um, on Broadway. And he was like, well, I still want to hear what you think. <laughs> and so we sat down for a bit. Okay, this is our, uh, actually, I have two more two more questions. One, okay. uh, re- one really quick one. And then a mm-hmm. funny one that I ask everybody. Okay. Oh. All okay. right. So what play is on your bucket list? Play or musical? Oh, huh. Huh. <laughs> wow. Oh my God. That's uh, come back to me with that. I'll come back like, to you. you we that? Can, Is that a thing? Yeah. yeah, we can actually uh you think about it and then I'll ask you again in the curtain call. How's that? Okay. Oh, okay I love so, it. So this is a fun question that I ask everybody. Uh you can ask you can answer it however you want. And okay. so because this is a show that we were both in and this is a show, this is the show that I met Travis in. We did Porgy and Bess at Court Theater. So I have to use this cast for this question. But in the cast of Porgy and Bess at Court Theater in 2011, who would you slap? Who would you hug? Oh. And who would you take to lunch? Oh. <laughs> I would slap Sean Blake. Of course you would slap. You have to describe who these people are. Like they're like, <laughs> so, Sean Blake, 
Um, he's like, imagine the Supreme in a, in a coven. <laughs> um, oh <my> God. <laughs> he's going to kill you. <laughs> he, um, is, uh, you know, um, one of the original, um, yeah. sort of, uh, singer, dancer, actors, um, and, and by that, I truly mean like original. he he was he served you know Jesus at the Lord's Supper. Oh my the, God! Uh, at the Last Supper, <laughs> um, one of the originals. Um, and just like a true sort of like Chicago Chicago performer, um, he played sport in life in the production. It was really really terrific. Mm -hmm. um, I think I know he was nominated for Jeff, but I don't know that he won. Um, I don't know I about recall. any of the wins that year, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we, we first met uh, doing Raisin at the Court, which is the musical version of A Raisin in the Sun in 2006. So, yeah. He gets the slap. Um, <laughs> hug? Who would I hug? Uh, um, now I'm trying to think about... Oh, I'm like, wait, wait. Um, Harriet. I knew you were going to say Harriet. <laughs> I'm I'm two for two. I knew you were gonna sh <laughs> slap Shy on Harriet. And the next one is who would oh well let's please tell everyone who Harriet is. Harriet Inzinga Plump. Mm -hmm. Um she uh, uh, we also first met uh, on Raisin. She played Ruth, um Walter Lee's wife. Um she's not just Walter Lee's wife, but um yeah, that's who she was. Um she's this amazing classically trained singer. Um, very, like, I remember you guys had, like, a very sort of sisterly relationship. Yeah, we did. You know? Mm -hmm. um, and she's just, like, super kind and really talented and I think, like, doesn't get enough, like, uh, love in Chicago, whether by choice, like, she may have stepped out or, or whatever, but, like, yeah, I just think she's so lovely. And she was, like, just a really nice, like, mature voice in the room for all of us, I think. Oh, yeah. Action. She was definitely the voice of reason and calm. Yeah. And peace, yeah, yeah. and motherly, yeah. like snacks, and you know, yeah, she's great. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then out to dinner, uh, out to lunch, out to lunch, mm -hmm. out to lunch, out to lunch. Okay, yeah, that's different. Okay, cool, cool. I see, I see. Um, who would I take out to lunch? Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say because I've already said you for the previous, <laughs> so I'm actually going to say at the previous question not the previous response uh i will say um bear, bear oh bellinger. you take bear yeah okay so tell yeah. everybody who bear bellinger is bear is an amazing um chicago currently chicago uh actor activist writer um he's very active on social media um having a lot of important conversations in chicago um in that production he was peter um we'd actually met the who's the honey man Mm -hmm. um, we'd actually met the year before when we did um, we took classes um, out at a theater in Chicago just like a musical theater auditioning class um, and I remember Doug Peck being like I think you guys are going to be really good friends he's going to be in our show next year too and I was like oh cool Like, nice to meet you sir um, <laughs> and, and you know we didn't really hang out that year but then like the next year we became like fast friends so um, yeah I would love to like I would love to catch up with Bear like now and I really should like text him or call him or something. But I would just love to like like he's always good for like good conversation and like really thoughtful and like very deep. I love those answers. I love those answers. I have another one coming for you uh, in uh, in the curtain call. But until we get to the curtain call, we will have to say bye to Travis for a little bit. If you want to hear or see more of Travis Turner, you can follow him on Instagram at Travis Tavares Turner, and we will see you at the curtain call. Play us out, Austin. Mm -hmm.